Hey everybody, I'm Dr. Matt Munger, and today we're going to be looking at Genesis 1 and the way that it reuses, recycles, and reinterprets the Babylonian creation story called the Enuma Elish. The Enuma Elish literally means when on high, which is taken from the first two words of the text. And it was discovered by archaeologists in some clay tablets in the ancient city of Nineveh during the 1800s. In the same archaeological dig, they found this uh, sculpture or relief that was carved into the walls of the palace there. What we see here is a scene from the Enumilish where the gods are battling it out. Um, we'll talk more about this here in a minute. The text of the Enumilish has later been identified in a handful of different tablets from different periods and contexts in ancient Mesopotamia. The most interesting feature of this text is probably found in the Assyrian adaptation of the text, where the main god of the Babylonian pantheon, Marduk, has been replaced by the Assyrian god, Asher. This shows that the text was in use and being read and recycled throughout the ancient Near East in, uh, in the period about the time the Bible was being written down. Now, we don't know exactly when the original text of the Enuma Elish was written. The text as we have it seems to come from the second millennium BCE. Wilfred Lambert, the scholar who has worked most with the text in recent years, dates it to the Middle Babylonian period, so sometime between 1600 and 1150 BCE, though there's a good chance that our current version comes from an adaptation, uh, is an adaptation of something that was written even earlier. The Enuma Elish was an important text in ancient Babylonia, uh, and it was actually even read and dramatized during the Babylonian New Year's festival. So the Enuma Elish is both a theogony and a cosmogony. This means that it's not just the story of creation of the world, uh, which would be a cosmogony, but it's also the creation of the gods. So it's a theogony. The story goes basically like this. Um, the two primordial gods uh, are Apsu and Tiamat. Apsu represents the fresh water, while Tiamat is depicted as the salty waters of the seas. In the beginning, there is nothing, only these two water gods. They mix, and their mixture produces the other gods, first Lahmu and Lahamu, and then Anshar and Kishar. And from the two latter, Anu is born. And from Anu comes Ea who you might know by the name Enki. And from Ea, then we have Marduk, who is the real hero of our story. All of the other gods are super excited, uh, but Apsu and Tiamat, they just want to relax. But these other gods make so much noise that Apsu and Tiamat decide they need to kill off the other gods uh, so they can have their rest. Now, the other gods fight back, and the god Ea kills Apsu and builds a temple from his remains. Now Tiamat rages and brings an army of creatures with her to attack the gods. Uh, but Marduk rises up and defeats Tiamat. Marduk throws down Tiamat and creates the world from her corpse. Now later, Marduk completes creating the known world from her remains. Humans are created after all the battling is done to give the gods a much needed rest. Now, there are several points where the creation account in Genesis 1 is clearly playing on themes that we have in the Enuma Elish. So let's look at a few examples of this. First, we see already in Genesis 1, verse 1 and 2, in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while the wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Now, the universe is conceived of as a formless void. This is common for Genesis in the world of the Enuma Elish. This formless void turns out to be water in both texts. The Enuma Elish begins with uh, a description of the waters in uh, tablet one, uh, line one through five. So when the heavens above did not exist and the earth beneath did not come into being, there was Apsu, the first in order, their begetter, and the demiurge Tiamat, who gave birth to them all. They had mingled their waters together. So we see that in the beginning, there is water. The Enuma Elish makes it clear that everything was, was full of these waters, these two waters. And the mingling of these two waters is what later produces the second generation of gods. The primeval waters are Apsu, the fresh water, and Tiamat, the salty sea water. Two points are important here. First, as we see at the end of Genesis 1-2, a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. 
Now, many of you might remember this text as the Spirit of God sweeping over the waters or something like that. But the NRSV translates this with a wind from God, both, both because the word in Hebrew, ruach, uh, can also mean wind or breath, but also because saying Spirit of God gives too many associations to something like the Holy Spirit, which just isn't a concept that the Israelites, ancient Israelites operated with. Regardless of the translation, the waters that were being swept over parallel Apsu and Tiamat in the Enumelish. The second point here is that the word that's translated, translated as deep in the Hebrew, from the Hebrew word to home, uh, is, is really interesting. The word to home is a cognate of the Akkadian word and name Tiamat. So they both mean sea, but have just followed different paths of linguistic development into the two different languages from an earlier proto-Semitic form. One of the theories about this word uh, and what it's doing here is that it is playing precisely on the place of Tiamat at the very beginning, or at least the idea that the salty sea is what is there at the very beginning of creation. Now, the second parallel I want to look at is the separation of these waters in Genesis 1, 6 to 8. Here we read, And God said, Let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate waters from waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome, and it was so. And God called the dome sky. Now, the idea of separating the waters from each other makes perfect sense within the cosmology of the Enuma Elish where the two waters are named. They are Apsu and Tiamat. They are the first thing in all existence, and they fill all of existence. So this water was everywhere in this formless void from Genesis 1-2, and has to be separated here in the text in Genesis 1, 6-8. When we read Genesis without the background knowledge of these two waters, it makes no sense to, to talk about separating the waters from the waters. But when we read it in light of the Enum Elish, we understand that these waters are then the waters of Apsu and Tiamat. But it's not just in Apsu and Tiamat that we see the water uh, images playing out, but also in the fact that the waters have to be separated in order to create the earth. So when we look at uh, Tablet 4 of the Enum Elish, we see this. Her inwards were distended, and she opened her mouth wide. This is Tiamat we're talking about. And then Marduk lets an arrow fly and pierces her belly. He tore open her entrails and slit her innards and bound her and extinguished her life. He threw down her corpse and stood on it. So this is Marduk defeating Tiamat in a scene in the Enumelish. And look what happens next. Marduk rested, surveyed the corpse, and in order to divide the lump by a clever scheme, he split her into two like a dried fish. One half of her he set up and stretched out as the heavens. He stretched the skin and appointed a watch with the instruction not to let her waters escape. He crossed over the heavens, surveyed the celestial parts. So what happens here is that Marduk sets up the corpse of Tiamat and places her to hold back the waters that are on high. So what happens when Marduk does this is that he creates exactly the same kind of dome that we have in Genesis 1, 6 through 8. The waters that are above will fall down if there's not something to protect it. In the Enum Elish, this is half of the corpse of Tiamat. So these texts are very closely related here. And we see that the images that are depicted in Genesis um, are, are mellowed out in relation to the myth that we find in the Enum Elish. But at the same time, the conceptual framework is incredibly similar. So the third parallel I want to look at is uh, also related to this heavens that is created. But this time, it's about the creation of the sun and the moon and the stars. In Genesis 1, we read, Let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them over the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and rule over the night and separate the light from the darkness. When we look at the Enuma Elish, we find that 
a very similar thing happens when Marduk sets the stars, the moon, and the sun in place. Here we read, this is Marduk. He fashioned the heavenly stations for the great gods and set up constellations, the patterns of the stars. He appointed the year, marked off for divisions, and he set up three stars for each of the 12 months. He created Nanar, the moon, entrusting to him the night, and he appointed him as a jewel of the night to fix the days. And month by month, without ceasing, he elevated him with a crown, saying, shine over the land at the beginning of the month. Now, after Marduk had set the boundaries of the heavens in place, he moves on to the important work of establishing the heavenly bodies, the stars, the moon, and the sun. In the Babylonian context, the sun and the moon and the stars represent deities, or they are deities, and they are represented by the sun, the moon, and the stars. This is clearly reflected in the text uh, of the Enuma Elish, where the constellations of gods are mentioned specifically in addition to the moon and the sun. And the moon and the sun are, are named by name. So Nanar, the moon, and Shamash, the sun. Now, the text of Genesis very closely parallels this idea of placing the heavenly bodies uh, in the sky, where God and Elohim is the name of God here in Genesis 1, places them in the sky and creates the dome after creating the dome to, to keep out the water. But it's not just the placement in the skies by Marduk or Elohim that's paralleled here, but it's also the function of the heavenly bodies. They are for signs. They sign, signal the seasons and the days and the years. So the purpose of these heavenly bodies goes beyond just giving light, but they're also connected to establishing the calendar. So the final parallel I want to look at comes from the creation of humanity. In Genesis 1.26, we read, And then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. This text is very clearly related to the creation of humans in the Enuma Elish, uh, Tablet 6. So when Marduk heard the God's speech, he conceived a desire to accompany uh, to accomplish clever things. And he opened his mouth and addressed Ea. He counsels that which he had pondered in his heart. I will bring together blood to form bone. I will bring into being Lulu, whose name shall be man. I will create Lulu, man, on whom the toils of the gods will be laid, that they may rest. Now, some of what we read here is uh, more closely paralleled in Genesis chapters 2 and 3 with the creation of humans there. But there are a couple of points that we can make about this text here. So first of all, um, one of the things that has you know, been difficult to interpret for scholars through the years is the use of the plural form we and our in Genesis 1.26. Uh, so let us create in our image. Um, but the strange plural forms of Genesis are completely at home in the world of the Enuma Elish. And Marduk decides to create humans. He takes his idea to the other gods, first to Ea and then to the other gods in the pantheon. And together they decide how it should be done. And the way humankind is formulated as an idea from the main god brought to his colleagues is just a very clear par parallel between these texts and, and the, in general the idea of the way the gods worked together in the ancient Near East. Now, second, the role of humans is the same in these two texts. In the Enuma Elish, humans are created to bear the burden of the gods. And this burden is taking care of the earth, the animals, everything on it. In Genesis, this is expressed very clearly too. The humans are created to fill the earth and subdue it. Now, third, the result of creation of mankind is important. Probably the most important point is it lets the gods rest. This is made very clear in the Enuma Elish. Uh, here at the end when it says, on whom the toil of the gods will be laid that they may rest. This is for the gods to not have to work anymore. We see the exact same thing in the Genesis account. After the six days of creation, after the humans are created, God rests. Now, Generally, this is interpreted as being part of establishing the Sabbath as being the important festival for God and all this kind of thing. But when we look at it in the text, we see that one of the things that happens is this transition from as soon as man is created, God gets to rest. Now, this 
picks up on this very important theme within the Inum Elish, that that God needed to rest when he was done with his work. What we see here is that there are a number of different parallels that fit uh, between Genesis and the world of the Enuma Elish. Now, not all scholars would say that the author of Genesis 1 was sitting with a copy of the Enuma Elish when he wrote it. But at the same time, most scholars see that the world that's portrayed in the Enuma Elish is so clearly connected to what we have in Genesis 1 that there must be some connection between the conceptual world of the Enuma Elish and what's going on in Genesis 1. Now, could the Israelites or Judean scribes have had access to the Enuma Elish? And the answer is, of course they could. Um, remember that some of the copies of what we have of the Enuma Elish were found in the palace library of Nineveh. So Nineveh is not Babylon, but the story is a Babylonian text. The story was also adapted into the Assyrian context. So we see that this was a text that was traveling around throughout the ancient Near East. It was influential. It was also read at the New Year's celebration in Babylon. We have records that show this. So one of the things that we do know about Judeans and, and Israelites is that they were taken into captivity in Babylon in the 6th century BC. So when we look at that connection, at the, at the very least, we can posit that it's very likely that Judean scribes, Judean uh, high-class people that were taken into exile would have been exposed to this story. It's not surprising. But very likely, people in the whole uh, Levant, the ancient uh, Middle East, would have been exposed to this kind of story through different cultural contexts. Um, so can we say that the Enumilish itself, in the version that we have it written on the clay tablets, is that what influenced Genesis 1? Maybe not. But the traditions that lie behind the Enumilish and the storyline certainly did. Thanks for stopping by. Make sure you subscribe if you want to see this kind of content.